Hello and welcome. <laughs> I'm Stephanie Marcus from the Science, Technology, and Business Division. Um, I want to take the opportunity today to say happy 60th birthday to NASA, and I only wish that I were that young. <laughs> today, um, we're going to hear about eclipses and occultations and other shadowy effects. We are still buzzing about the eclipse that we had last year. It was just really such an amazing, kind of life-changing event for some people. And of course, we're looking forward to the next one in 2024. But in the meantime, we've got a lot of other shadowy, what does he call it, shadow science. We have a lot of other things to learn about. Tess took off finally, looking for exoplanets. And we have the best person to talk about it because Dr. James Green was the chief of planetary sciences and was recently chosen to be NASA's chief scientist. So he's got some new duties and it'd be really interesting to hear about that too, but not today, I suppose. So uh, Dr. Green got his PhD at the University of Iowa and worked there with Dr. Van Allen. And then um, in 1980, he began his career with NASA down at the Marshall Space Flight in Alabama and then came to Goddard in 1985 as head of the National Space Science Data Center. Then in 2006, he became director of planetary science. Um, so that, if you want to know more, you can Google him because he has quite a long and detailed history there at, at NASA with many awards and many achievements and, of course, as chief of planetary sciences, he oversaw some really cool missions to Mars and past Pluto, etc. So please help me wel welcome Dr. Green to the library. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I know uh, many of you perhaps uh, had an opportunity last year uh, to go to Alex Young's talk uh, prior to the uh, fabulous eclipse that occurred across America. Um, uh, and uh, so here's a follow-up. We're going to talk about what we learned during the eclipse. Not everything that we learned during the eclipse, but at least it gives you an idea uh, that we can actually do some really new science. So we'll be talking about that great eclipse. Uh, then I want to uh, change gears a little bit, and we're going to be talking about how we use eclipses to learn new things about the solar system and set ourselves up to learn even more uh, than, than uh, are originally planned for many of our missions. And then, of course, eclipses are one of the critical ways we actually find planets in other solar systems. So we'll talk about what we've learned from that. So we have um, a number of really uh, spectacular sets of science that we do. And, of course, we'll start with the uh, great eclipse of uh, 2017. You know, uh, what's really spectacular about these eclipses, you know, you would think that we've learned everything that we need to know about the sun and that we can learn from eclipses since they occur somewhere on this globe about every 18 months, okay? But in reality, when NASA goes to eclipse, they will, they will go to a couple sites, they will set up uh, several sets of uh, experiments, and then they will... Uh, execute those experiments. But the 2017 eclipse provided us an opportunity that was just too good to pass up because we had um, all kinds of things that we did during this eclipse. Um, uh, I, if I could uh, say it this way, NASA really owned this event in the sense that um, we did some really great things. So here's a little animation. Uh, of course, uh, this cut across the United States. Uh, what you see are, are how the uh, sun would look at different locations along the path of totality. The path of totality is, uh, is that red stripe. <clears throat> uh, we did a lot of work in terms of analyzing uh, who in America could have seen the eclipse, and, and the results of that are absolutely astounding. 154 million Americas, uh, Amer a million American adults, since we couldn't survey kids, watched it live, okay? Uh, 20 million traveled to see it, you know, where they were in far reaches of the United States, which couldn't see any part of it. Um, uh, but then came, uh, came uh, many of them came to the area of totality. 61 million viewed it 
uh, either over the internet, w which we supported, or um, uh, uh, through the through the TV, for which we had uh, broadcast stations all along the eclipse path, and that results in 88 percent of the American adults saw the eclipse in some way, shape, or form. All right, it's truly a phenomenal event. Um, it's for NASA. It really started just before uh, we hit. Um, the shadow hit the United States. We had uh, planes out. Uh, these planes were carrying instruments uh, that will probably end up on satellites in the future. And here was a perfect opportunity to test their sensitivity as we look right at various features of the sun uh, because we can block out the main light of the sun. We can see these fine detailed uh, images. Uh, and so, um, uh, here's a little uh, uh, movie of the eclipse shadow coming in over the Pacific uh, as it then entered um, uh, the United States. And, and then the instruments could uh, to look at the sun and, and uh, really look at a lot of the fine details of the, of the lower atmosphere. Um, we, we observed this eclipse through the eyes of many telescopes from many satellites and in many different ways. So here's an image out of um, uh, our lunar mission, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that's orbiting the moon, uh, looked back at the Earth and, uh, and saw the shadow as it was crossing the United States. And what it tells you when you look at this, uh, it, how lucky we were as a nation to be able to have such a large area of the United States clear for us to be able to really uh, look at and enjoy the eclipse. So uh, how many were in the clear areas? How many actually had an opportunity to, to see it? So uh, my, my quick look looks like that's 88% of the audience. <laughs> so very, uh, very good. Now from spacecraft that were dedicated to look at the sun, of course you had to be along the eclipse path to see totality, but many of them uh, of course saw different things. So here's the moon moving in front of the sun as seen from um, uh, one of our um, uh, major spacecraft uh, that uh, is looking at the upper atmosphere of the sun. This would be, this would be the, um, uh, the corona. Uh, so this area is really actually high above the sun. The surface of the sun, uh, if you were to put uh, uh, the sun in this image, it would, it would be a globe that would be smaller than the edges of this, of this frame because this light is coming from a region that's higher up in the atmosphere, okay? And so what we want to do, of course, is we want to tease out what's happening just above the surface of the sun. Now, from our spacecraft, uh, we look at the atmosphere of the sun. This is the extended atmosphere of the sun. It's called the uh, corona. Uh, and the corona uh, is, a, is um, uh, as shown here. This is one of the, the best from our spacecraft that we can do. So here's, we have a, an occulting disk that we put in front of it, and, and we make measurements all the time. And, and we see coronal mass ejections. We see all kinds of things. And the light that you're seeing is actually uh, material that's leaving the sun. The sun constantly outgasses in all direction. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of dust that is uh, left uh, in and around this area as comets come in and, and are disintegrated by uh, the sun's light. Uh, some survive, um, uh, but many don't. Uh, and so this area is just full of dust and that dust enables uh, the scattering of light that gives us this image. So this is really very low light compared to the very bright disk of the sun. Now if I were to put the actual globe of the sun on this image, it would look like that. So what we're not seeing is everything uh, that's below the red and to uh, the surface of the sun. And this is really the, the, uh, the atmosphere just above its surface and then it merges into that, that um, uh, corona. And this area is called the, the chromosphere. The atmosphere is called the chromosphere. So indeed, we want to be able to look at that uh, and the eclipses provide us the perfect opportunity to do that. 
Um, what we want to do and try to understand how active the sun is over time is to e use our massive compute capability to be able to really model this area. Uh, it's full of magnetic fields. These magnetic fields are very strong and they, they either uh, uh, allow um, hot gases that come up from the sun to return to the sun or to come up from the sun, go into the corona, and then get accelerated and blasted out. Uh, they also, this region has all sorts of phenomena uh, where uh, coronal mass ejections start. This is where magnetic fields close together, creating huge bubbles of atmosphere. And just like uh, your boiling pot, uh, they become buoyant and they pop off the, the globe and move into um, the solar wind and those bubbles will go all over the place and when they come and hit the earth it really uh, wreaks havoc with the earth's magnetic field and we always receive aurora uh, during coronal mass ejections and so uh, here's our model so there's the the magnetic field we modeled before the event uh, here is that upper part of the um, uh, atmosphere we call the corona and what we want to do is is uh, look below that and then here's a here's that brightness distribution and polarized uh, light allowing us to tease out the kind of gases that are circulating in these magnetic fields and then that produces these two images one is a model done in a computer and the other one is what everyone saw, okay? Um, and um, just to tell you which one is which, the lower one is the real one, all right? And so we're doing quite well with the modeling. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting there. Uh, if we really have any hope of understanding and predicting space weather, these are the, the uh, uh, coronal mass ejections and flares that occur to the sun that uh, when uh, they are directed to the earth uh, can actually wreak havoc uh, on our electronic devices and even our power grids, then this is a fundamental thing to do. So we've made major progress in, in this particular e eclipse. Uh, and then, of course, there's uh, the absolute beautiful images that, that comes from an event like this that um, everyone uh, enjoys. Uh, that was just one of many things we learned during the eclipse. Uh, but I want to move on and talk about uh, how we use eclipses to uh, explore the solar system and do a variety of really important and unique ways. And, it, and if I can start with a Cassini at Saturn. Okay, Cassini uh, was orbiting Saturn for um, about 13 years. Um, you know, the Saturn has the beautiful rings, and it was making unbelievable discoveries, what we would call transformational science discoveries. And one of these is um, the moon uh, Titan. All right, Titan is a, a fabulous moon of Saturn. Uh, this particular moon is, uh, has an atmosphere. Uh, that atmosphere actually is twice as dense as ours on, on its surface. Um, it's uh, made mostly of nitrogen. It has a variety of trace gases of methane and ethane and other uh, gases. Uh, this body is so big, it's larger than the planet Mercury. Okay, it's larger than a planet, the planet Mercury. And if it wasn't orbiting Saturn it went, and it was orbiting the sun, we would call it a planet. I mean, this is really a very special object. It's special also because it is the only other body in the solar system besides the Earth that has liquid on its surface, and a lot of it, okay? But that's not liquid water, it's liquid methane. And so um, uh, water is important for life, and the new concept is, if we want to look at places where there might be alternate types of life, you need a liquid as a, as a part of the metabolic process. You know, we use water in ingesting food. It helps the, uh, it helps the process of extracting uh, the energy from that food, and then water is used uh, for eliminating the waste, okay? 
That process is a fundamental one that, uh, that's part of our definition of life. And so we want to go to places where there are liquids. Uh, this one in particular, if there's life on this moon, it's got to be very different than our life, okay? And there's a whole field of study called weird life, okay? That's what they call it. Call it weird life, uh, where they're studying uh, these alternate types of life that would use methane in substitute for water. So that means that Titan uh, has a, a potential for life, uh, and so we want to protect it. Another moon that we discovered, uh, which is on the right, Enceladus, it's a small moon, much smaller than Titan. It's actually only about um, uh, 300 kilometers in size, um, you know, on the order of the width of California, for instance. Uh, and this particular moon, we found um, uh, really walls of water. They look like geysers. They look like individual vents that are occurring. But when we looked at them up close, it's really uh, from emanating from these cracks from Enceladus. These are literally walls of water pouring out of the moon. And it, and it does it all the time. Anywhere in its orbit, uh, these cracks are active and the water is pouring out. And it turns out 95% of the water falls back down on the, on the moon, but there is a small percentage that escapes it and then ends up orbiting uh, Saturn. So uh, because, as I mentioned, the importance of water as it's connected to life, then this is a moon we need to protect too. Now Cassini, when we launched it, uh, we did not develop the planetary protection procedures necessary to uh, keep it completely clean. You know, so it's got human microbes all over it, all right, even though we, uh, we develop it in clean rooms and, and uh, uh, that it, it, it's important to, uh, uh, to keep what we call this bio burden, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, human, human um, uh, cells and, and, and um, life off of it, uh, we, re we recognize that uh, if Cassini were to crash into one of these moons, it might affect the potential for life on these moons in, in um, important ways, and we just couldn't afford to let that happen. So um, over time, over time, it was brought to my attention that we have an opportunity to dispose of Cassini. Uh, here is a, a series of trajectories for Cassini, as you can see in blue. Uh, they're really wild. Typically, we'll orbit in a plane, but you can see these trajectories are out of the plane and they're going in different directions. And, and there are certain nodal areas or certain locations uh, that um, uh, you know, like right here, where, where a whole series of these orbits cross. And uh, that turns out to be where Titan ends up at the right place at the right time, giving us a gravity assist, allowing us to change the orbit, change the velocity, and therefore really make a major difference uh, in, in, um, in uh, its trajectory and surveying a much broader part of the uh, Saturn system. We did that very effectively. A set of orbits were calculated that uh, clearly, uh, as shown in the um, uh, yellow here, if we could get the right gravity assist from Titan, we could just go on the outside of the rings and then another gravity assist would put us inside the rings. In other words, between the cloud tops and the lower the first part of the, of the ring, uh, the lowest part of the ring, the closest to Saturn. This was really exciting. It enabled us then to uh, uh, come up with a plan that would allow uh, Cassini to end its life as its fuel was running out into Saturn and not, and not have the possibility of it, uh, after it ran out of fuel, hitting one of these moons, one of these precious moons. Uh, so that was proposed by the project, and uh, I am the one that signed off on it uh, to end Cassini's life. 
The scenario is uh, 42 short uh, orbits uh, from November 16 to September 17, and then 20 uh, orbits um, uh, uh, of that 42 uh, were what we call F-ring orbits, just outside the F-ring, and then 22 grand finale orbits, which are inside. Uh, so the F-ring orbits are here. The yellow and the blue are the last set of uh, the 22 grand finale orbits. All right. So um, how are we going to do this and do it safely? This area is full of ring material, OK? And ring material that you run into can uh, affect the spacecraft. Uh, can affect it uh, to the point of even knocking it out. So we had to be really careful. Uh, so the start of figuring out how to get in there, that was, uh, that was the dynamicist that we're using Titan to allow us to do that. But now we had to be very creative to say, well, exactly where, okay, can we go where we, have, where we can minimize the ring particles and then minimize the opportunity to damage the spacecraft such that it would survive because we wanted to be in complete control to be able to ditch it, all right? It starts with shadows. The sun in this picture is behind the planet Saturn, okay? This image uh, is uh, about uh, an eight or nine hour exposure of the faintest light that's in the Saturn system. And uh, it's light from the sun that shines on the rings that reflect back onto the planet that then reflect back out, and that's what you're seeing. Now, what's really spectacular is you see all sorts of new things. Here is the orbit of Enceladus, okay? The material that is coming from the plumes, the, the walls of water, uh, that ask, actually escape that moon end up orbiting the planet, all right? So that's not very comforting. That's just full of material. Here's the F-ring. So the first set of orbits would be in this area right here. The next set of orbits would be right below here. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, figure out how close to the F-ring we can get we're going to take a really good look at this particular area uh, that's uh, shown in red. Here that area is blown up. And um, surprise, we found a couple new rings. <laughs> this, the, the, the eclipse technique is the only way to be able to do this. So uh, this is uh, Janus and Epimetheus. This is a brand new ring right here we saw. Um, Pauline ring. Uh, this is the Enceladus ring. And, and so there's the G-ring, and so we want to we wanna get in here. So this looks like the best place right here, all right, uh, based on scattered light. Okay, this is all scattered light, the ring material, and, and this looks like the darkest. That must have the lowest number of particles. Now, those particles may be the size of baseballs or bigger, but and very few of them, which would still give you... Uh, that dark area, but we're taking a chance on that, okay? So if we laid out the rings and distance from the cloud tops, uh, we decided then, uh, here's the set of the first orbits we want to go to. This is the clear area. And then from these images, we also decided, okay, we got to hug the, cl the planet cloud tops, all right? So th this ring material actually is falling into the planet. We're really very lucky to be living in a time where these rings exist. Because in reality, the ring material is falling into Saturn, okay? It's dissipating over time. And so this particular area, uh, we, we decided uh, uh, it was the, the darkest in our images. We could probably, probably get away with flying through here, being hit by a number of ring particles. Uh, but um, uh, perhaps the, the, the flux of material raining down from the rings is low enough that we could, we could survive that. So that, that's, the, that's the process. And, uh, of course, um, uh, we executed that uh, in a spectacular way. Now, what we found when we did this is uh, from that vantage point over the pole, some spectacular images of these smaller moons. Uh, that we could only see from afar. 
Uh, here's, here's what they look like. You know, uh, from, from a ravioli-looking look, moon, uh, which uh, this actually is ring material. So um, uh, the orientation of this image is a little awkward, but this, you know, the camera takes it and you, you use it. But the, the, this belly band actually is in the ring plane. So as ring material is moving from one part of the ring into a, a different ring, it's crossing this area and pan, this moon, picks it up, okay? It will pick it up uh, and accrete it, all right? And so here's another one, Atlas. Uh, this also is uh, uh, embedded in the rings. And uh, this is a, a set of ring material. Uh, Atlas has an orbit that's not quite completely um, uh, uh, coplanar with the rings. It's at a slight angle. And so the ring material has an opportunity to, to, be, to be sloshed all over it, as you can see here. Uh, and then um, uh, several of these objects, like, uh, like this one in particular, Helene, I believe, is the name of it. Uh, I can't quite see it from here. Uh, that looks like a comet. This looks like what we've seen before when we fly by comets. So uh, uh, these big objects, uh, Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, uh, they must also be capturing comets as, uh, as they have gone along and orbited. So those are just some of the surprises. And of course, we flew over the pole. Uh, here's uh, the north pole of Saturn, and uh, uh, we see this spectacular hexagon pattern, okay? This is absolutely spectacular. Now, uh, this is uh, the size of a couple Earths. So one, uh, one Earth could be uh, like here and another, another Earth in size here. So this is just an enormous region. We, we really don't understand this hexagon very well. How come it's set up in the atmosphere? It's a jet stream, okay? Uh, and, and in fact, we, we've recognized now that this is probably a little higher than the surrounding clouds, okay? Uh, down here at lower latitudes. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, what we would call a hurricane. Uh, the, w the one that's coming uh, this way would be itty-bitty compared to the size of this one. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's comforting. And then this, uh, this particular feature, which is another spectacular feature, uh, we've, we've taken a really good look at, and you can see based on the shadows, uh, that, that these are beautiful cloud structures uh, 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 swirling around the pole. This is exactly the, the, the pole of Saturn. And indeed, uh, these, uh, these cloud structures, uh, like cumulus clouds, just r reach way up into the, way up into the sky. And, um, and so this is uh, the, the cloud dynamicists are ju we're just, in, uh, just really enjoying the, the observations that were made. Uh, uh, in these, um, in the dynamics that they're seeing now. Now, this is an artist's conception of what happened in the, in pretty much in the final orbit. Uh, and indeed, uh, because we had uh, on the order of 22 orbits that we did, uh, the last orbit was the last little kiss by Titan, and it enabled it then to shorten the orbit well enough to to uh, uh, begin to enter the atmosphere. Uh, this is indeed what happens. Uh, the spacecraft would burn up on its way in. But we put in the process, uh, executed the, the uh, antenna hold process such that as uh, the spacecraft was going in, it was communicating back the data, back the data to, to Earth and going through the atmosphere and being moved around in the atmosphere and it would constantly fire its jet and reacquire the Earth to make sure we got, uh, we got the data back. We got some unbelievable, spectacular upper atmospheric, ionospheric profiles and data uh, that, that were really astounding and, it, and uh, some of the chemistry is quite different than we ever expected. I don't know why we didn't think of this, but indeed, as the ring material is flowing into the planet, it's creating a rain of organic material that's falling onto this body. And so, so the chemistry is, uh, is really exotic, okay? That we found. And so uh, uh, this is actually a mosaic made up of quite a few images, but it's the last orbit just before it went around uh, and then into the planet on the other side. And as you can see, the sun 
the sun is on that far side, and, and the earth is, uh, is uh, not in view here, but is uh, definitely uh, would be able to see the spacecraft in that final orbit. That's how we organized it. And uh, it was uh, just a spectacular event. That whole event um, was um, uh, broadcasted live, and um, uh, the Cassini uh, 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 outreach team won an Emmy this weekend for that live broadcast. It was, it was done so well. It was uh, sprinkled in with a variety of interviews and uh, uh, some of the emerging science that was coming out. We were talking about that and in and out of the control room. And, and um, uh, it was um, quite an emotional event uh, for many of us uh, because this spacecraft uh, had done so much for us to learn about these gas giants. Uh, so I'm just thinking back, of course. New Horizons. Now here's another planetary mission flew by Pluto. Uh, but let me go back here. Uh, what you may not know is um, uh, this mission was launched 2006, January 2006, encountered Pluto uh, July 14, 2015, all right? But when it was launched, we didn't really know where Pluto was, all right? Now, that sounds pretty strange. What do you mean we didn't know where it was, okay? Uh, we use Kepler's laws. Kepler's laws tell us where planets are. And for Kepler's laws to work, we have to watch the body make a complete orbit, all right? So one orbit of Pluto is on the order of you know, 248 years. And we just discovered it 85 years ago, all right? So we had a piece of the orbit and we could draw a thousand orbits between those observations, all right? Now, when we flew by Pluto, uh, because it was four and a half hours light travel time from the spacecraft to us, uh, we had to have everything on automatic pilot. So when we said, okay, point your camera and take a picture of Pluto, and we pointed it, Pluto better be there, okay? And if it's off by a thousand kilometers, we'd be looking at sky, all right? So um, how are we going to solve that? How are we going to solve that? We're going to start solving these things by looking at precise measurements of where it's at, okay? And it starts with occultations. And occultations are when, as we see the body, you know, uh, move in the solar system, and there's stars in the background that are much further away, and they pass in front of that star, that starlight goes away. And by timing it, we can get an idea of all kinds of things, whether the body has an atmosphere, its distances, its size, whether there's uh, moons, whether there's a debris, uh, understanding if there's debris in the way, we could be flying by Pluto and get smacked by all sorts of, uh, of smaller debris that you just can't possibly see. You know, we can hardly see Pluto itself, you know, which is on the order of 2,000 kilometers in size, you know, like the state of Texas. It's, it's a, a country of its own right. <laughs> so um, we had an opportunity using SOFIA uh, to take an occultation measurement. And so what, what you do in these measurements is you uh, sit there and look at, look at Pluto, study it, watch it move, okay, and then have it pass in front of a star. And so here's the starlight that we're steadily measuring, and all of a sudden Pluto starts to pass in front of it. Down it goes, uh, and then it comes back. Now this is what we saw. If Pluto did not have an atmosphere at all, this would be what we call a square wave. It would follow that black line, go right down, go right back up. That's what, it, that's what we should see if it didn't have an atmosphere. But it does. And so that atmosphere starts to attenuate what we call reduce the light from the star, okay, as we see it and in this configuration. So down it goes, and then when that star is directly behind the planet, it illuminates the atmosphere. So the light comes, bends around the atmosphere, and we get to see this little flash, okay? So this flash right here tells us also a lot about the atmosphere too, and then we get, we get the complement on the other side. 
These were critically important observations. That plus many other observations, including Hubble, including New Horizons, which would take uh, navigation images as it's moving towards the target and allowing us to triangulate it, gave us a really good idea as to where Pluto was. And of course, this is the spectacular body. Uh, it surprised me, um, and I'm not easy to surprise, uh, but uh, this is an active body. Its atmosphere is modifying its surface. Uh, this heart region that we see, actually this is an impact uh, for which the atmosphere has collapsed into it. Uh, Pluto's atmosphere is largely nitrogen, and so this is a nitrogen uh, snow, ices, that end up in this area that actually move on the surface like toothpaste. You know, it's a it's uh, not, not as solid. Uh, uh, and, then, uh, and then there's all sorts of these dark regions that we then had an opportunity to really get a good idea as to what the chemistry of those areas are. But one of the things that we absolutely planned to do when we flew by Pluto and got on the other side is to take this image, okay? This is Pluto in our rear view mirror and the sun is directly behind it, and it is illuminating the atmosphere, just like that occultation image from Sophia. And this enabled us then to then take a really good look at, in high resolution, of what this atmosphere looked like, and it's banded, uh, and and then we could get composition and all kinds of uh, all kinds of information about it. Now, as a vista, when you look at this, you know this is glacial. Uh, these are high mountains. I don't see any craters in any of this, all right? You couldn't go any place on the moon, uh, 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 certainly over this scale length, and much smaller even, without finding craters. Now, that doesn't mean this body hasn't been hit. It's been hit plenty of times. It should look more moon-like than it does, and this is why we know this body is very active uh, still today. And the, uh, the atmosphere and land interactions are, are, are uh, uh, quite strong, and it's modifying the surface of the, of the planet. One of the exciting things was we could look at the atmosphere, and um, uh, what, we, what we found out is uh, the methane uh, that Pluto has uh, from sunlight and also from hitting, being hit by solar wind creates new molecules, ethylene, acetylene, and, and these are chains, and these chains can come together, and when they get heavy enough, as they, as they continue to combine, they will drop to the surface of the planet. And, and that means it will snow these compounds, and we call these complex carbon compounds tholins, and we can actually go in the laboratory and make them, okay? We know, we know what they consist of. And in fact, um, when, when you look at Pluto, here is the regions where tholins uh, continually snow out. This turns out to be uh, close to the equatorial band of Pluto. Uh, uh, the, uh, the pinkish colors, now we're coloring Pluto based on, uh, on composition. Uh, the pinkish colors actually are uh, water. There's a lot of water on its surface. It's frozen. It's frozen so solid, it's harder than granite, okay? Harder than granite here on Earth. Uh, we see uh, uh, all kinds of ammonia snows, uh, and then we can see uh, the carbon monoxide and the, and the nitrogen snows too. So uh, really uh, spectacular, and it's because of the occultation technique that helped us find it, and the occultation technique that helped us even do more research on the atmosphere of Pluto. Now we're moving on to another object. Uh, New Horizons is going to fly by a smaller building block of, of Pluto-like objects. Uh, it's called, uh, when it was found in 2014 by Hubble, no, no ground-based telescope can see it. Only Hubble has been able to see this object, okay? And, uh, and, and so uh, this is uh, uh, the nomenclature of anything you find starts with the date and, and the, uh, the letters and numbers are all about calendar time. And so this was seen in October 
uh, of 2014. It was called MU69. We had a contest as to what to name it, at least provisionally, and, it, and, and its uh, provisional name is called Ultima Thule. Okay? So um, uh, what we found is that MU69, as it's moving in its orbit, because we don't really know where it is either, you know, this is going to be, you know, 380, 400 year orbit, and we just found it in 2014, just four years ago, okay? So we're going to have to use every trick in the book if we're going to really figure out where this object is so we can fly by it and not miss it, okay? So um, uh, we found out that there are, uh, with the star background, opportunities to do occultations, what we know about this region of space, called the Kuiper Belt, for which, uh, um, uh, for which uh, Pluto is a member of the Kuiper Belt, is there's tens of thousands of objects, Pluto-like objects and, and objects like this, building blocks of Plutos, and many of them are binary or multiple objects. 30% of these are, are viewed as uh, multiple objects. And so um, uh, if this then works out, uh, we can watch an occultation. Even though we can't see the object, if we can just look at the star and watch the light go away, that object had to be moving in front of it, blocking that light, okay? Even though we can't see the object. Uh, last year, uh, 2017, we had three occultations. Here they are as they uh, are over the globe, okay? As you can see, we don't have a lot of land uh, to go to, all right? So uh, Sophia actually, we, uh, we used Sophia to go out in the ocean and get this one. And then we set up uh, observations in South America and South Africa and then South America for, for, for uh, each of these occultations. Um, and this was really hard to do. Now how you do this is uh, you calculate where you think this shadow is going to be as it races across the country at 53,000 miles an hour, okay? And you create a picket fence of telescopes, okay? So here's the telescopes, and they're look, each of these are looking at the star, okay? And you're hoping that that shadow, that you're only backing out and guessing where it's going to be based on your best calculations and, and the knowledge of position of that star, um, uh, casting that shadow. So you want this picket fence to be long enough uh, so that uh, you actually catch the winking of the star. Now here's the telescopes. The stars are bright enough that the telescope like this works great and it's all about timing. It's all about taking uh, measurements of the star image, you know, what's its intensity over and over and over again many, 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 many times per second in the hopes that, that it'll wink. It'll wink at you. It will come and go. And then you get that timing. So um, here's from one of the telescopes looking at the star field. So uh, has everyone seen where uh, MU69 is? It's uh, right here in the center, and it passes right in front of that star. And the star winks. Okay, that's it. Now we know where it's at. All right. <laughs> Uh, and the picket fence, you know, many of these telescopes saw it. You know, when we put the observations together, together from these telescopes, so, so here's the set of observations where it winked. So that's one telescope, another one, another one, another one. Um, uh, if we had a telescope here, uh, sometimes we have operational problems, sometimes they're cloudy, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work for us. And then we got another one. So here's the original data, all right? Now... You're going to try to figure out what, what this object is. is it, does it look like this, or does it look, uh, uh, is it actually two objects? Is it, is it actually like the rest of the Kuiper Belt object, where there's binaries? There's several of them. Now, that, that's important because that means this stuff is still accreting. They're still trying to come together, and there's probably debris all over the place. So, so that, that's kind of a tough thing to swallow. Uh, so uh, here's an artist's conception of what they might look like. But we're flying by Ultima Thule on January 1st, 2019, all right? And, and when we observe it, it'll be the first time we will observe a building block of Pluto. 
This is a very different building block than a building block of the earth. All right? uh, these will be made mostly of ices. All right? And uh, this particular object, we believe, if it's two, as we see, we don't quite know the size, but if it's one object, it's on the order of 30 kilometers in size, all right? Okay, which is much smaller than even uh, Enceladus at 300 kilometers, all, right? uh, all done by occultations, all right? Other ways we use shadows, uh, we'll talk about eclipses, all right? So, so um, we have a telescope called Kepler. It looks at starlight and it makes a measurement of the brightness of that light. And when it drops like this, then an object is passed in front of it. And the bigger the object, the bigger the drop, okay? And it's that technique that tells us about exoplanets, tells us about planets orbiting other stars, all right? And Kepler does that by looking at 120,000 stars all at once, all the time. And it did it for nearly two years, all right? From that data, we then started to cull out of that um, what kind of planets are they, how big are they. Now, as you can see, the depth of that curve tells us about the size. Uh, the orbit, to, it can be calculated based on how long, how long that reduced in intensity was, all right? So the further the planet is away, the slower it moves, and therefore the longer it takes for it to come across the disk of the planet, and so the light will be low for longer periods of time the further the orbit is away. So we can get size, and we can get orbit, okay? And of course, then we can also get number. So if we, we plot the number of planets that Kepler's been observing uh, during this time period and their size, here's the distribution. To me, this is shocking, all right? It's shocking because I felt that what we would see would be planets that are dominated by Jupiter-sized objects, okay? Here's Jupiter, all right? Now, here are Earth-sized objects. So at any, one, any, any solar system that you go, exosolar system, you know, uh, uh, we are as equally likely to find a Jupiter as we are an, an Earth-sized terrestrial planet. But the surprise was this set of planets right here, okay? Huge number of planets that are terrestrial planets that are, are, are uh, about uh, one, to two times the size of the Earth, okay, um, and um, that was a shocker. We don't, have a, we don't have a planet like that. There's no planet like that in our solar system. These are called super-Earths. Now, we can see Neptunes, if you get Neptune, make it a little bigger. Uh, now, Neptune is, uh, is um, uh, as you can see, three to five uh, times um, the radius of the Earth, all right? And then you can create these gas planets that are further away from the uh, further away from Jupiter. We had no problem with that. We we suspected there'd be a range of gas planets, but super Earths are completely different objects. So we now know that they're terrestrial planets, and then when we follow up with other observations and can find the density of these planets, then our models tell us some of these planets are water worlds, that there's huge oceans on many of these bodies, okay? So uh, an Earth has a core, uh, a, a mantle, and a crust. In a similar way, we expect uh, super-Earths that, that are made close to the parent star to be primarily Earth-like, all rocky. And of course, um, even though they're uh, uh, one to two times the size of the Earth, the density might be as much as 10 times that of the Earth, okay? So talk about heavy, all right? The, the you know, bodies are, are, are very heavy. The gravity on the surface is, is uh, very much higher than ours. And then there are those for which the density tells us there has to be an extended envelope 
uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an artist's conception, so the ocean isn't really that big, but it's an ocean atmosphere because there will be evaporation going on and, and an extended region, but covering the planet. So these super-Earths are, are generated further from the star where water could actually exist without being boiled off or frozen out. So pretty, pretty spectacular planets. So um, why don't we have a super-Earth? Well, we don't know. We don't know. But it's probably because of Jupiter, all right? Jupiter has, has robbed us of another planet that was forming that would have been in the asteroid belt. The asteroids that we have that exist in the region between Mars and Jupiter are trying to become a planet. But Jupiter robs them of that opportunity because as they crash and then reform into a, 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 a bigger body, they crash, disperse, but Jupiter's gravity pulls these parts away and makes them more difficult to get together. And that's why they haven't come together because of Jupiter. It's also because uh, Mars is a runt because of Jupiter too. Mars is a terrestrial planet much smaller than the Earth. Now, if we didn't have Jupiter, we may have had a super Earth there, okay? And if it's a super Earth there, trying to create a space program to go to a super Earth land, rove, look at it, and uh, for human exploration to get off of it, that would be really difficult. So in a way, thank goodness for Jupiter because it's made Mars a runt and made it accessible to us. We can land on it, we can, we can walk around, and we can leave it. We can, we can actually blast off from that planet without having uh, the, the infrastructure we have at Cape Canaveral. So other, uh, in the futures uh, for, for eclipses are really shown here. Uh, this is a, a, an eclipse in our own solar system. This is Venus. This is our sun. And, and indeed, you can see the sunlight illuminating the atmosphere as it is bent around the planet. And it's during these times we want to take a spectra. It's during these times we want to tease out what it looks like. Would it look like Mars? Would it look like Earth? Would it look like Venus? So our future missions to really look for exoplanets with atmospheres and then what those atmospheres are and whether they could be habitable with life is indeed going to be done in these eclipses just like this. And so here would be a detailed spectra of Earth in that same position where we can tease out of it all sorts of, of uh, variations in that spectra attributed uh, to life. So our future missions are really going to be moving in, uh, in that particular area. So finally, let me end with um, a shameless plug, okay? This is my podcast. It's called Gravity Assist. I'm in its second season. It's pretty popular. Uh, we have uh, an enormous number of downloads. It's about 20 minutes long, and I talk to the scientists of the day that are deep into these discoveries. They really understand what's going on and can explain it really well. Uh, uh, things that we talk about won't be in textbooks for um, perhaps a half a decade or even a decade. Uh, and, and it just gives you a great feeling for how fast the, the whole, field is, uh, whole field is moving. Get it on iTunes. Um, you can also go to the NASA and pull it down. All right. Well, thank you very much, and I hope you've enjoyed how uh, we use eclipses to do some pretty spectacular science. Thank you. I'm going to blame all of my problems on Jupiter. <laughs> Questions for the speaker, and he'll repeat the questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Dr. Green, just curious, we've seen photographs of the, the Earth, and you know, we know that we've got a uh, plasma or a liquid lava and so forth before. For the sun, if we went to science fiction, if we were to be able to go straight towards the center of the sun, is there a solid aspect to the center, or would you pass all the way through some plasma that's radiating out? It's all plasma, all the way through the center. Yep. 
Now it's under uh, enormous pressure, and so the, the density of it uh, increases radically. Uh, so uh, uh, repeating the question, uh, is the sun have any solid aspects of it? And the answer is no. It's all plasma. It's all gases. It's just under uh, different uh, uh, pressure scenarios. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, we know the ice on Pluto is harder than granite by going into the laboratory, reproducing the conditions, and um, freezing it. In, in fact, we know water, H2O, as we take it down in temperature, uh, it's not like, like the ice cube you put in your drink. Uh, uh, the, the whole matrix of water can get closer together and making it harder. It readjusts itself, and so we... We have actually several divisions of, of uh, that lattice structure. You know, we call it ice one, ice two, ice three, ice four, okay? And then so when you find the temperatures and pressures and, and look at the conditions, the only way water can exist is in these structures. And then, and then reproducing in the laboratory tells us how strong they are. Yeah, yes sir. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the question is, why, how, how did we get all the nitrogen? Why is that so abundant? Um, uh, it's got to be a major part of our collapsing cloud. Uh, nitrogen is what we call an inert gas. It doesn't react. Uh, it doesn't create, you know, a whole slew of stuff, uh, compounds. Um, uh, and so um, uh, it's, a, it's a very important gas. Um, uh, we have a significant amount of it here. Venus has virtually none, all right? Mars has a little, but not a lot. And as you go further out in the solar system, we see a lot of, a lot of these places are dominated by nitrogen. We've been able to hang on to our nitrogen, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why we have life here. So it's, it's actually kind of connected to, our, to the life question. But it came from the original collapsing cloud. Yes, sir. So, what do I think about uh, Pluto being a planet? So, um, uh, I, can, I can tell you as a NASA employee that we don't care. <laughs> we, don't, we don't care if the astronomer, I'm a planetary scientist, so I don't care if the astronomers run around calling it, you know, itty bitty, itty bitty dwarf planet or whatever they want to call it. Um, uh, uh, because this object is well worth studying in its own right. But when we flew by it and you look at it, I am absolutely shocked by what I saw. It has an atmosphere. It is an active body. It is, it is modifying its surface. I can list a, a gazillion things about it that happen just like a planet, okay? And so I think, now I'm going to give you my personal perspective, <laughs> that whole definition needs to be revised, uh, re-looked at now that we've flown by Pluto and taken a good look at to what these objects are like. Just because it's small doesn't mean it uh, doesn't have planet-like features, and it's got a bunch of them. As chief scientist, perhaps you can make that your mission. <laughs> There's only so much I can do. <laughs> yes, sir. Activity implies energy. If activity, mm -hmm. if there's activity on Pluto, is most of it coming from gravity interactions with its moon? So uh, activity implies energy. So where is the energy on Pluto? Really great question. We've been after that. So part of that is sunlight. Another part is that it must be coming from the interior. This has brought up the idea that Pluto actually has an under crust, deep in its interior, a layer of water. And that water is starting to go from liquid to solid. That liberates heat, and that creates heat that's moving through the body. Okay? So that whole concept is how we get to the place where we believe Pluto is a water world, okay? It's got, it's got a layer of water uh, underneath it. 
we also believe that that's the case because that heart region uh, where the nitrogen ices are is very depressed, okay? It's where uh, uh, the least gravity is, and it is exactly opposite Charon, okay? And so wherever that impact occurred, that whole planet's shell shifted such that that least gravity was exactly opposite Charon, okay? That fits perfectly well with that idea too. And those are exactly the questions we answer and these are the things that we come up with <laughs> to, uh, to uh, great effect that give us great con uh, confidence that Pluto is indeed a water world. Yes? Yeah, so what kind of tools are we using, like on the exoplanets, when we look at an atmosphere? You know, what, 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 how are we going to do that? Uh, we know what to do. Um, most of the instruments that will make those kind of measurements haven't been developed. Uh, we have thoughts on what they need to do and what they need to be, and uh, we're investing in some of the instrumentation in those areas. It's going to take several, you know, many years to be able to develop them and perfect them, uh, and then and then figure out a way to test them, you know, perhaps with other eclipses. We'll find a way to do that and then and then launch a mission that has those kind of instruments on it that will really tease it out. Now, we're sort of getting close with uh, the Webb telescope. The Webb telescope can look uh, at, at the atmospheres of bigger planets, okay? Because typically the bigger planets are further away from the suns and the, the light that they, those uh, planets receive are coming from the suns, absorbed in the atmosphere, and then that's a perfect uh, wavelength regime for Webb to tease out. So we'll make a huge stride with Webb, uh, particularly on the larger planets, but, but we can't quite get down to an Earth-size atmosphere yet. That, that's going to require some technology development. One more? Just one more. Yes, sir. So the question is, uh, uh, I did talk about some pretty spectacular uh, discoveries, but I didn't talk about or dwell on the discovery of water everywhere, okay? That's my other lecture called The Search for Life Beyond Earth. <laughs> so perhaps next year I'll be invited back and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, then, then that story is all about the water. Okay, start working on it. <laughs> Maybe we'll get one on weird life. Well, that would be part of it. I'll talk about what we know about weird life. Yeah. Yeah, that'll draw on it. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.